This is Jacqueline Lukeman with The Real News Network. Political statistician and editor-in-chief of 538, Nate Silver, found himself in hot water recently when he seemed to refer to the diverse supporters of Bernie Sanders' campaign as, quote, residue, end quote. He spent the past few days sort of walking back his comment, sort of being defensive, but never really acknowledging the problem with his words. Why is what Nate Silver said a problem? And is it a bigger problem that analysts like Silver are comfortable with delivering what is supposed to be data-driven analysis with a heavy side of personal bias? Well, talking with me about this from Atlanta, Georgia, is Anoa Changa. Anoa is an attorney, a progressive strategist, and she is also the host of the podcast, The Way with Anoa. Thanks for joining me, Anoa. Thanks for having me. So Nate Silver's tweet a few days ago saying that not sure Bernie should get credit for having more diverse support than last time, given that he has far less support than last time. A lot of voters have left him. White liberal liberals uh, have been particularly likely to leave him for Warren. So the residue of what's left is more diverse. Now, this is in response to a tweet where someone says that Sanders' support is more diverse than it was in 2016, which is good, but that doesn't help him in Iowa. Anoa, in your opinion, do you think this particular critique about Sanders' support from Nate Silver was even necessary in the context of the original comment? I mean, the comment, the original comment was about Iowa not Sanders' overall campaign support, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think you raised some really good points there opening up and just asking, even is Nate's critique, you know, even warranted in this? And actually, in many instances that he's opining randomly, uh, uh, rather wildly about the Sanders campaign and how the Sanders campaign is and isn't building. Now, my own personal critiques and objections aside, because uh, that's what real big people analysts can do, right? That you put aside your personal issues to just really deal with the facts of the matter at hand. And, you know, oftentimes Nate Silver, who is known as a statistician, who is known for data-driven analysis, I mean, really weighs into these conversations in a way that is riddled with just personal opinion, hubris, and bias, that is not actually grounded in a, what we would say, a real-world understanding of the data at hand. And quite honestly, you know, I appreciate the work of, like, organizations like Repower um, and other people who look to deconstruct data and analysis, because the, the bias we're seeing and the way in which he talks about it, the way in which he's engaging right now. I mean, post-2016, you would think Nate Silver would be so much more careful in the way he's engaging in presidential analysis. And yet, here we are with this really atrocious quote, right, this tweet. Doesn't matter what he meant to say, what he thought he was saying, what he was trying to say. I mean, none of that matters on Twitter. You have 280 words, uh, characters, and what you say is what you say. <laughs> you can always delete and try to clean it up. But for better or for worse. Down. For better or for worse. And he doubled down for a bit. He's tried to clean it up some, but it's like it's after the fact. And, you know, when you're engaging in this type of analysis, which many of us have for several years now, you you should have developed an acumen. But Nate Silver and his parent company, ABC News, um, has just been, or ABC Media, whatever it's called, they've been way too content with the way in which he engages and builds and does work. And it's really disheartening that we don't have consistent good data analysis and engagement around issues like the polling about how the candidates are building and what their constituencies look like. Um, there, there are a lot, like I said, there are a lot of issues and conversations about what does more diverse mean, how that's being measured, et cetera. But to the point of the tweet from Silver, calling people residue, because you're talking about people, right? It's, it, it's super egregious because you're talking about Black, Indigenous, POC folks, but it's, it'd be particularly bad if you're just talking about people generally, whether he was specifically, but, but, the, but the implication that the only reason why there is diversity is because they're the folks who are the re residue. And residue has a negative connotation, right? right. Like, I mean, I get, I think what he's trying to say is that because there were, the, because Bernie's uh, support was so overwhelmingly white in 2015, the fact that the white people have left means that his support has become more diverse because it shrunk, allegedly, per Nate. However, whether or not that's a valid analysis or, or anything to make is one thing, but the language used absolutely matters. And someone who uses language for a living, he should know better. 
Yeah, so so let me go back to, to what you said about the point he maybe was trying to make that maybe his white, uh, uh, Sanders, white voters uh, or white supporters have left him. Even if that argument was valid, let's just take that on its face mm -hmm. and ask the question, sorry, was Sanders' support ever full of white liberals, as right. Silver says? Right. That, because he specifically says white, white liberals left. have left Sanders. Right. Was right. that ever really his base of support? I mean, like, you know, Nate's entire, like, body of discourse around the Sanders campaign, like, so I did catch myself, right? And I'm so thankful for Nate for messing up like this to bring us back to reality. Nate had actually a decent tweet, I felt, the other day about um, whether or not journalists should be looking to see if there is a story around um, Joe Biden's son and dealings in the Ukraine, right? And so mm -hmm. he had a tweet, he's like, you know, the issue with the emails wasn't the fact that the emails existed or the server existed, it was the balance and the way coverage occurred. And I agree with that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm agreeing with something Nate Silver is saying, Ooh, this must be upside down day. And it was because in true Nate Silver form, he turned right around and stuck his foot in his mouth and here we are. But what I think you're talking about in terms of like whether or not the base is white liberals, I mean, people who are more liberal in the liberal media use words like liberal, progressive, left interchangeably when it suits them. And they act like they're completely different things when it when, when it suits them, right? right and so I right. think that when you're actually looking at the base of support that Bernie Sanders, yeah. you know, develops, in 26, 2015, 2016 cycle, a lot of different peoples, whether they were actually super left or not, did support Sanders because they saw him as a viable alternative for the nomination. Some of those people have chosen not to support him again. But, you know, what's the great thing we're seeing around across all the candidates, the major candidates, it seems like people are looking at how do they build and grow a winning coalition on values and issues that matter. And unfortunately, that seems to be a, a topic or a concept that Nate Silver doesn't grasp very well. Mm. Now, you mentioned that he does Double down on explaining his critique, and he did, and and it 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 actually got worse. Um, yeah. Can because you imagine it getting worse? <laughs> I I, could, I actually could not imagine that he could have made it worse, but he actually did because his his original argument was that voters of color was were the residue, which is bad enough because, mm -hmm. like you said, language mm -hmm. matters. <clears throat> Excuse me, but then he went on to say that the reason Sanders uh, POC indigenous and black support uh, is more than it was in 2016 was because white voters left, uh, but he actually has less support than he originally had in 2016. So he was contradicting himself in trying to, mm -hmm. to kind of not take accountability. Can, can you even make sense of any of that? No, absolutely not. It's just white mediocre man gibberish. You know, no diss to white mediocre men who may be watching. Uh, I appreciate you. Please start a support club and get, get Nate Silver collected and together. I really do think that uh, his attempts to make it sound better made it sound even worse. Um, I also don't like the way that a lot of pundits um, discuss Black and, you know, Latino and other voters of color. Uh, folks tend to talk about us as if we're too stupid to know who to follow, when to follow, like we're not strategic, that we don't engage around our own best interests in elections. Um, and we're also about a relationship building. And, you know, the senator and, you know, other folks connected to this campaign have built some relationships over the past few years. You know, he did show up in Mississippi for a Nissan worker strike. What was that? In like 2017, alongside Danny Glover in a matter that really, in a moment that really mattered. And there have been these instances where, you know, through his network and through his connections that he has built these relationships, whether or not they are, you know, as strong as relationships. Like I said, I have a lot of critiques and, and, and considerations in terms of the Sanders campaign, whether or not they're doing it right. However, it comes from a good faith and a good place and wanting to see people do their best. Uh, with Nate Silver, I absolutely do not believe that they, that he or anyone of his ilk wants to see the Sanders campaign do well and do better. And I don't think he's pushing them to do well and do better. I think he's, you know, crap posting for, you know, followers and for other folks. I, I it, it's, people treat this like some type of game and, you know, the, 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 the work of building and defending democracy is really serious business that there are many organizations, such as the one I work for, the New Georgia Project, are taking very seriously 365 days a year, 24 seven, 
right? And and we are building constantly with folks. And you know, we're urging candidates on through our work in terms of like our C4 work for organizations that do have C4s and PACs of the sort, you know, encouraging candidates to do the work necessary to build with communities so that they have winning coalitions to not just defeat Trump, but to shift the balance of power as we are seeing across multiple issues in this country, right? Right. And I so, mean, so, so let me, let me, so, so let me, let me interject for a minute because you said something that's really important, organizing and relationship building. Now, mm -hmm. I, I want to be clear to our viewers that we're not sitting here defending Bernie Sanders as a candidate. We're talking about, we're doing what analysts do, right? We are doing, we're putting our personal biases aside and we are talking about the fact that there is a, a, a disturbing um, discourse around some Sanders supporters that's out there that's being handled and confronted uh, on social media and now in the wider media uh, uh, universe. Twitter and Facebook have been practically alight with responses to Silver as this hashtag, uh, hashtag residue for Sanders has trended. People are sharing photos of, of Sanders speaking to um, diverse audiences, people of color, indigenous audiences. There, it, he, Sanders apparently was, uh, uh, had some speaking engagements over the weekend, I think, mm -hmm. at uh, HBCUs. Um, so the Sanders campaign seems to be doing the work and they seem to have taken to heart some of the criticism of Sanders and his campaign that came out of 2016. Um, that, you know, we, I think we can argue about the e efficacy of those efforts, but people are making it clear that they are concerned with the way their involvement in these campaigns, whether it's Sanders or anybody else, is characterized by the so-called pundit class. Um, so what are your thoughts on Nate Silver's further characterization on the pushback he's gotten from this mm -hmm. campaign? Because he went on to say in another tweet that, again, just made it even worse, that the annoyingness of some candidate supporters keeps uh, reporters and, and analysts from criticizing those candidates uh, at, to, to basically, to paraphrase, paraphrase what he said. Uh, again, all candidates need to be criticized. And you have had experience yourself with some of the uh, heated pushback from some Sanders supporters of that criticism of him. So is there a kernel of truth in what Silver said in that last tweet about how annoying some candidates' supporters can be. And then, even if there's a kernel of truth in it, does it really matter in the context of what he said? Mm. Mm. Really great questions. One thing I will note is whether or not they have actually taken seriously the critique from uh, folks on the outside, grassroots supporters, former black staff, which you don't see many of them back in the campaign, no shade, just facts, um, is, is yet to be seen, quite honestly. I mean, some of this is window dressing. People th say, oh, you have events. All the campaigns have events and reach out to people and have sit downs. That doesn't automatically mean that because people attended events, even the people seemed excited at events, that that is automatically those candidates' co coalition partners. I mean, Beto O'Rourke just had a sit down in Oakland with marijuana, you know, organizers and activists and agitators. I mean, and it went well. Doesn't mean that that roundtable of beautiful black folks from Oakland are now supporting Beto O'Rourke. You know what I'm saying? So I think that we need to understand that it's great when candidates do take the time to attend convocations and other events at HBCUs and other places, but that doesn't automatically translate into now they have a diverse base. They are doing some of the work, but we'll see what the back end organizing and actually engagement strategy actually looks like. Um, I still don't even know if their campaign even has an African-American outreach director or staff, like actual staff, not surrogates. So um, having said that, I do think that Nate Silver is trying to obfuscate from his actual own behavior, right? And this is what we see from people when they don't want to take responsibility for what they do. Whether or not Bernie Sanders supporters are annoying and, you know, harass and engage, I mean, you have bad behavior on social media, Twitter in particular, um, you know, in the political sphere. It's something we've talked about in 2016 when you look back to what was happening during the Obama, you know, you, the quote unquote Obama boys in 2008 on message boards. It's just evolved now. Um, so I do think that there is 
There is a particular tone, I think, that is interpreted from Sanders supporters on social media um, because of the framing of being in, like, you know, it's a battle, it's a us against them. I mean, even though the slogan's not me, us, there is an attitude or approach that, you know, it's us against the world. Like, they've been listening to too much Tupac or something, I guess. Um, which can even result in attacking and engaging in what can be seen, what can be interpreted as attacks on social media to organizers, organizations, and people who should be natural allies, right? But that actually happens, you know, multiple different spaces from other different, you know, supporters of different candidates from time to time. It does get hyper amplified, I think, because of what appears to be coordinated, you know, in terms of the way some folks act. Now, whether or not that's a real thing or not, like I said, is a whole other conversation. But my thing tends to be that we need to look at the way in which we're organizing and engaging digitally in general, because we need to be organizing, building digitally the same way we build off the ground. I mean, that's what I do. Um, and I, I know I'm an, I antagonize people sometimes because I call it straight like I see it and folks don't like it. And it is what it is. And we got to work it all out. But um, to your other point about whether or not, you know, it matters, I don't think it does. Even if Sanders supporters are like the most egregious, worst, abusive people in the world, I don't think it matters in terms of what Nate is saying and doing, right? Like Nate Silver is an egregious person with a large platform who is wrong, unfortunately, often, and was bigly wrong in the 2016 election cycle and clearly has not learned much and has not stuck to what he's actually good at. Right. I mean, he should be covering horse races and NBA playoff games or something like that and not really wading into, you know, commentary on, uh, you know, contemporary American politics, because he's unfortunately in many instances off his off his basis um, outside of the numbers. And even the way numbers are reported, numbers are skewed. Numbers are reported through the lens of the person reporting them. So that bias uh, filters in, even when we say someone should just stick to their data analysis, data statistician lane. It has that white male lens bias built in regardless. So mm. uh, we need to decontextualize all this stuff. So let me ask you this last question. How mm -hmm. much more difficult is it, or or is it more difficult for people of color, Latinx, indigenous, black voters to do exactly what you say needs to be done, which is organize on the ground digitally uh, and, and in, in, in the, the lane of, of established politics and outside of that, how, how much more difficult is it to do those things when you also have to combat these kind of narratives coming from, as you just said, people with on large online platforms who are very influential in the political sphere, and maybe they shouldn't be. I mean, even when you look at news coverage, right, and how organizations like mine have to fight to get covered properly for the work that they do and the struggles that are ongoing. Uh, tomorrow, well, Tuesday, September 24th, is National Voter Registration Day, and so you'll have efforts all across the country, and it's great people pay attention for one day, but voter registration, fighting voter suppression, um, you know, building the, the, the resources, the power, the opportunity that we need to see to substantially change from the local level on up uh, is a year-round process, as I said, and it requires funding, it requires resources, and it requires support and lifting up and understanding who the champions are in your community and lifting them up and letting them know that you're there, that you see them, and that you appreciate and value the work that they're doing because it's underfunded, it's undervalued oftentimes, and it's under-resourced. And we do have folks like Nate Silver out there who are, you know, crap posting, and they could actually be doing some good with their with their, you know, followings, with their large platforms. I mean, same thing we see with some of the, the opinion writers from the New York Times and other outlets too, right? They spend a lot of time punching, punching down and, and distorting what's really happening and what's really facing Americans across and, and folks who are um, not considered Americans, but who are still most definitely here and a part of our communities who need to have really good coverage, really good information so they can learn more about what's going on. But it, it creates a, a heart larger lift for us who are doing this work. Um, but we just got to figure out how to work smarter and, 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 and tap into resources where we can to amplify and leverage our voices, our work with the tools and resources we have. This will certainly not be the last conversation we have on this particular issue. Uh, doesn't even have to be Nate Silver, but as you said, the entire corporate media narrative about particular groups of voters in this country just makes organizing and being involved in the process so much difficult. But I want to thank you so much, Anoa, for joining me today to talk about this issue. Absolutely. And thank you for watching. This is Jacqueline Lukeman with The Real News Network. 
Hey y'all, my name is Tharna Noor and I'm a climate crisis reporter here at The Real News Network. This is a crucial moment for humanity and for the planet. So if you like what we do, please, please support us by subscribing at the link below. Thank you.